Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. You can have some of the highest quality of life in places that are outside of the United States, culturally speaking, in terms of the society and the infrastructure, the way that you live. But in order to really create wealth, investing in U.S. real estate and U.S. assets is, is one of the best ways to do that. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I'm your host, Billy Keels, and I am super excited to bring you another amazing conversation that is going to help you move forward faster and feel much more confident. So listen, so here's the thing. Before we get into that, I just want to remind you once again, and I want to thank you for continuing to leave your honest ratings as well as written reviews for the podcast because we continue to move up the charts. It's amazing. Uh, more and more people are listening. In the, the So whatever you're doing, just keep doing more of it because our community continues to build. So uh, like I said, if you haven't had a chance, especially if you're an Apple user and you want to leave an honest written review as well as rating, do that. We make a, we made a little easy video in case you were trying to figure out how you do it. Just go click the video on the show notes and it'll show you exactly how to do it. But make sure you leave that honest written review as well as rating. The other thing is a lot of you are asking about how you can find previous episodes. Like you can't find them because they're not on your, whatever your platform is or whatever. You can literally, if you just go to billykeels.com and when you get there, go to the podcast tab, you can find every single episode ever that we've ever released. Billykeels.com and then go to the podcast tab and you can find every single episode that has ever been released there. So uh, with that, I really want to talk to you about today's conversation today. I mean, today's guest, Amazing background, has really had an international, has lived in many different places, lived in places like Rio de Janeiro, uh, lived in Puerto Rico, has lived in, well, London, lived in Madrid. And uh, even during today's episode, like, although he resides in the Midwest, like he was in one of these places. I mean, it was just really, really cool. And also too, you, you can start to see that no matter what background you come from, Uh, When you are focused on understanding what your challenges are and you're looking for solutions to those challenges, there is always a way out. Now, this person, and he's going to talk to you more about it, started in the hospitality industry, moved from hospitality industry, got into real estate, was working with a large real estate investment trust and recognized some inefficiencies and processes, but gained a lot of insight, not just in investing, but business building, et cetera, et cetera. And today, there, he's actually started a company that is helping lots of people that are actively as well as passively investing. And and you're going to find out more about that in today's conversation. So I'm really looking forward to you hearing today's conversation with Jake Marmelstein. And that's coming up just after this. If you want to understand how combining passion with process can help you to become a successful groundbreaker in long distance investing, then guess what? Today's the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. I promise. You know why? Because today's guest not only started his career long ago as a market researcher in the hospitality industry. And for those of you who know me, I've also spent a lot of time working in the hospitality industry. He's also had multiple international experiences and he's lived in places like Madrid and London and Puerto Rico and Rio de Janeiro and other places in the United States. And I'm sure he's going to talk to us more about that. And he has this knack for, you know, bringing business leaders together to help them solve problems, as well as a heart for philanthropic ventures. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, the co-founder and CEO of Groundbreaker, Mr. Jake Marmelstein. Jake, welcome to the show, man. Hey, uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey, Jake, this is going to be really, really awesome. Love the pre-chat. Love your energy, love the things that you are doing, and that international experience is just awesome. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. So also too, as you know, Jake, um, one of the things that we do here is we want to make sure that everybody gets the same five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning, you're going to get three in the end, and in the middle, well, I actually have absolutely no idea what questions I'm going to ask you, but I promise you, they're going to be great. Uh, so here's the thing. If we can get started, Jake, the, the first question I would love to ask you, I'm going to actually make a little adaptation on this one as well. Can you help me and the Going Long family understand where exactly do you live? So uh, currently I am living in Chicago, Illinois, uh, which is very snowy uh, right now, but that's not where I am physically located at the moment. So 
uh, thank goodness. <laughs> so Jake, I appreciate you helping us understand where you live, but can you also make a lot of people happy? Can you just tell us if you don't mind, where are you now? Thankfully, I'm in uh, the beautiful city uh, called the Cidade Maravilhosa of Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> Fantastic. And yes, it is a marvelous city. It is, it is, it is. I've been there myself. So with that, would appreciate you sharing where you reside and where you are right now. Love this long distance lifestyle, very geogra geographic freedom. And also, if you could help us understand, what's the most positive thing that has happened to you in the last 24 hours? Okay, so I just got back from a long trip uh, where I was remotely located in the Amazon jungle near, uh, the, near the country of Peru, but still on the Brazil side. And, uh, and I managed to get back safely. And it was quite a, a travel. Um, I spent four hours in a boat and 12 hours in a van crossing. And then I had another eight hours in a, in a plane. So um, I, I'm just happy to be back and be able to sleep in a bed again. Man, that, that is absolutely fantastic. So most people do trains, planes, and automobiles. You did planes, um, boats, and automobiles. Okay, well, that's, that's a nice little tweak on that. Appreciate that. So, so here's the other thing, Jake. I try to do this like thing that's almost impossible. I try to tell your entire backstory in like four and a half seconds. <laughs> impossible task I give myself. So I would love for you to help me, but more importantly, the Going Long family, understand more about your backstory in your own words. If you could also, one of the things I do want to ask you is if you could, as you tell your backstory, if you could maybe talk to us about some of the major decisions that you've made to get to this point in your journey, and then we'll see where we take the conversation from there. For sure. So um, I grew up in suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my parents worked in the restaurant industry. My family is really from the restaurant industry. So at a young age, I got exposed to the food and beverage industry, worked in the restaurant, worked in the family business, did pretty much everything from uh, prep cook to front of house. And uh, then I went to school and studied hospitality management. Uh, there, I went and did a concentration in real estate finance. But throughout the years, what uh, guided me was really this urge to grow in a place where I wasn't comfortable. So I knew that I had to get outside of my comfort zone. And that's kind of what, did, what guided my decisions on where I worked, what I did. Um, so as soon as I got uh, into the university, I actually got a, an internship working in Intercontinental Hotels Group as a high school senior working in their corporate offices and uh, had never held like a corporate job in my life. So that was fantastic. Um, ended up going in 2009 during my summer internship as a graduated freshman to work in a tourism agency in Spain, living in Madrid, and didn't speak fluent Spanish, just kind of showed up with my bags in my hands. Um, didn't know anyone there, checked into work. Uh, they took me on a, on a, on a wine tasting event um, in my first week and asked me if I knew the way to get home. I was like, okay, sure. You know, of course got lost. Couldn't find my way. Like learned every area in the city that I needed to know. This was pre smartphones, pre GPS and everything like that too. Mm -hmm. So, um, always just, you know, trying to, trying to get exposure to new experiences and grow. Um, so in 2010, uh, I went and studied abroad in Brazil. I did a six month, uh, study in the university of Pukihio where I studied only in Portuguese classes. I did, um, did all kinds of uh, different studies there, but also got to travel around the country. And uh, I wrote for a local hospitality and leisure magazine as well, where I did review restaurants and hotels, which led to a lot of interesting adventures. Um, and I made a very important connection down there with the city uh, government. And uh, that actually helped me get my full-time uh, job upon graduation, which landed me back in Rio de Janeiro. But in between that, um, I worked in a real estate investment trust and started investing in distressed hotel assets. Um, and th that experience got me the hands-on analytical and underwriting experience that led me to be able to know enough of what I was doing in real estate to be dangerous. Um, and, and then I started doing some independent real estate uh, underwriting and research, actually internationally, and working with some family offices in the United States, 
Uh, and then that exposure to family offices um, and to real estate investing. Uh, once I came back uh, to the United States to work in a, in a full-time role, um, I started working in a institutional investment introduction company where I was calling on Latin American and uh, Brazilian pension funds and endowments, foundations, and family offices, and uh, inquiring about their ability to allocate an interest in allocating into U.S. Uh, assets. And uh, meeting those individuals, those heads of those funds in New York City, uh, and introducing them to fund managers directly in person and forming those connections. And then after that, um, I ended up getting into Groundbreaker. And I think in between that, I worked on my own digital marketing agency, kind of as a consulting thing, sort of learning search engine optimization, uh, web development and marketing, which helped me form a consulting operation on the side that allowed me to be able to free myself from working full time for somebody and give myself enough time uh, time and, and runway so that I could then dedicate myself to something that would allow me to uh, create my own destiny. Creating your own destiny, man, that, that for a lot of people can, it feels right, but a lot of people can actually make them feel really, really scared, right? Because there's, you know, there's kind of the, 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 the painting is not on the wall. It's actually a canvas, a free canvas to do whatever it is that you want to do. And I love the, the, the evolution of the story that you've told so far, and you've helped us also understand some of the, the, the decisions that you, that you made, but there was one thing that you said in the very beginning, right? As you were talking about your family and being a, in the, in the food and beverage industry, and then you went and I, I know uh, you studied at one of the top universities as it relates to hospitality industry, right? Um, but you mentioned that you wanted to be able to grow where you did not feel comfortable. And that was early on, right? And so this is one of the things that in my own personal experience, right? Having, you know, lived outside of the United States for the last 20 years and traveled to a lot of different countries. It's something that I've seen, but it, this is, you know, multiple years later. What do you think for you gave you the impetus at such a young age to want to look to be uncomfortable so that you can grow? Because I don't think that that, I think that's pretty contrarian, to be honest with you. Yeah, it might, it might, be, it might seem like that. Uh, it just, it just seemed like I was in a, I knew that I was in a safe environment where I lived and where I grew up. I wasn't exposed to that much. And I don't know, I, I, I want to be in control of my future. And I think that I firmly believe that I'm, I am the owner of my own destiny. I make the choices every single day that will determine my future. If something happens in my life, it's my choice. If there's a reaction that occurs, I decide how I want to react to it. So I just wasn't getting what I wanted in my life up to that point when I eventually went off to university. And then I was able to get out and have control over what I wanted in my life. And I took every opportunity I could. And they didn't have a lot of money, but I found the money, I found a way, and I made experiences happen in whatever way I could so that I could get more and more exposure. Because I didn't know what I, you know, I didn't even know what I wanted. I just mm -hmm. knew that I didn't want the mundane, the mm -hmm. things that I already knew, the things that kind of kept me protected. Right. So that, so there was, and, and at the same time, as you knew that you did not want those things, it helped push you to an area that what you did want, which was more control over the outcomes of your life. And with that comes a lot of responsibility, right? Because there, when you want to take full responsibility, there are a lot of things that can happen positively. And I love the way that you say that, but also too, talk to us about maybe when things didn't happen in the way that you wanted, because you've traveled around the world, right? You've lived in different places. You've looked for different experiences. And I'm going to go out on a limb here, Jake, and say that not all of them were a hundred percent perfection <laughs> in exactly what you, what you wanted to do. But so maybe you could talk to that part about having that freedom, but also accepting when things don't go your way and how you, how you accept that as well. Yeah, I think, um, so, you know, reflecting back on, on motivations for why, 
we do one thing or another, it's either you pursuing something that gives you a lot of pleasure or you're going away from pain. And I think yeah. for me, my natural inclination was going away from pain, away mm -hmm. from fear, the fear of living a simple life and the fear of being trapped and being, uh, getting closer to freedom was getting me further away from that fear and more towards the, the pleasure that I wanted to be able to control my own destiny. Um, and in that pursuit, certainly I found experiences like this one time when I was traversing across uh, the country of Germany and I was going to go to, uh, I was going to go to uh, the North of, of Holland. And I remember having to change trains seven different times throughout the night. I had to set an alarm every single time so that I could sleep and also get the next train. And I ended up getting all the way to Holland and then getting on a bus and I completely crashed and I'm taking this bus to the end of the country and I wake up and there's like one guy on the bus and he owns a farm with a bunch of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Hey man, where, you know, where, where am I? Uh, so, you know, situations happen and, uh, and I just like laughed at myself and I smiled and it wasn't the worst situation in the world because at the end of the day, um, I think you, you regret more of the things that you don't do than the things that you do. Um, cause something that you do can end, uh, in a, in a uncomfortable situation, but never, never once has, has it been a life threatening, uh, situation that's caused me or somebody else close to me, any pain or, or harm. Um, but there are moments that cause deep frustration mm -hmm. and, uh, you just learn to be able to be patient and deal with it and know that that's a part of life. Yeah. And when, when you recognize that that's a part of life, because, and I've been in a very similar situation. I remember, I remember moving to Paris, France. I didn't speak, I didn't speak French. I didn't know anybody. And I thought, well, you know what? I knew that I wanted to, I wanted to learn French language and culture. I wanted to learn more about salsa dancing. Don't ask me why. And I wanted to learn more about wine. And there were many days where I, I kind of wanted to pack the, pack my bags up and go back to stateside because it was just frustrating. I was calling, trying to get things done and it didn't work. It didn't happen. And, uh, and it was much easier where I came from, but then you look back on it and you, every, with every single uh, kind of uh, challenge or obstacle, when you break through those, you have a growth experience, right? And you just have to stick with it and you have to continue to go through it. And, and yours was, you know, in one specific instance, setting your alarm clock seven different times. That's awesome, by the way, man, <laughs> that, 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 that you actually went through that. Um, so I appreciate that. And being able to also recognize that you wanted to run away from fear or, or, or torch pleasure, as you, as you talked about before. There is one thing also too, because of the vast experience that you have, and one of the premises for for this show here, right, is, and you and I've talked about this, right? We have this uh, this love for learning and and being outside of our comfort zone and traveling the world and having certain geographic type of freedom and or experiences, and. I fundamentally believe that through one of the things that's helped me is being a more proficient uh, investor and in investing in assets today that are exclusively related to uh, the, or based in the United States. I prefer today to live and reside in, in Europe. You talked about something as well earlier as you were working, helping uh, fund managers help those that were outside of the, uh, the United States really look to allocate resources to uh, investment assets that were in the United States, it goes to the premise of the show, which is long distance investing. Invest where you want and, and, and live pretty much wherever you want. You were doing this on a much higher scale, a larger scale, but maybe you could talk to us about some of the things that you were seeing as you were working with either family offices or funds that were outside of the United States that really allowed them to say, hey, listen, I'm interested in an asset that is potentially tens of thousands of kilometers or miles, excuse me, where, where I'm living from and getting, helping us to understand what that mindset was about. Because most people tell you, well, if you're going to buy, especially if it's a real estate asset, you should buy the one that's in your backyard and just kind of feel comfortable with it. But you were fundamentally helping on another level, you know, allocate funds or assets or financial funds to things that were thousands of kilometers away. Yeah, it's just so, uh, so easy of a sell to international investors to invest in the United States because the market has the, the lowest uh, risk in terms of its political risk, um, economic risk. Uh, there's just a lot of reasons for people to be able to invest in, 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 the, in the US. Um, and especially from Latin American investors where their currency is being devalued and uh, they don't know, you know what laws are gonna take place next that might uh, increase the taxes on their money. Uh, they wanna be able to park, park their capital in assets that are gonna hold their value. 
not even to necessarily appreciate and give them a, a generous cash on cash return, but just to be able to hold the, the value of the assets um, so that there's something that they can that they can keep that's not in a bank domiciled in a country that where they don't really trust the government. Um, so that's more where it's about. And I think that <clears throat> the concern for them as institutional investors is, would always be uh, that they want to invest with somebody that they trust, that they know has a track record, that has done this before, that has good background check and good references. And um, it would take years and years for pension funds and endowments to invest, uh, whereas family offices would be able to invest a lot faster. Their investment thesis was was simpler, whereas a pension or endowment has a more complicated investment thesis since they're really investing with someone else's money. Um, so that's that's what I learned really from that. Well, and I, and I think what what I love about what you're sharing with us, Jake, is whether you're doing it on an individual level, like I have been, or the, with my most, most smaller company, right, and doing that, living in one place, investing where it makes the most sense, or you're doing it on an institutional level or at a family office. The, kind of the foundation is pretty much the same. You're looking for places to help you to derive some type of benefit. Some people are looking for yield. Some people are looking for tax benefits. And some people are looking just to preserve the purchasing power of their capital, right? And so you go to the place that is going to give you the highest probability of achieving that outcome, right? What you were talking to people in Latin and Latin America looking to invest in the U.S., not because they're looking for the high cash on cash return as you talked about, but really preservation of capital. And that is something that is the benefit is tied to each individual and it's very, very unique. But whether that's on a one to, on an individual level or an institutional level, it sounds like the foundation is pretty much the same. It needs to be tied to a benefit and you go to where you have the highest probability of achieving that benefit. Um, anything you want to add on to that? It looks like you maybe want to add something. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I believe that what, what we're talking about in this show is phenomenal because you can have some of the highest quality of life in places that are outside of the United States, uh, culturally speaking, in terms of the society and the infrastructure, the way that you live. But in order to really create wealth, um, investing in U.S. real estate and U.S. assets is, is one of the best ways to do that. Um, there's so many opportunities that we're seeing across uh, secondary and tertiary markets right now where population is growing and um, tax laws are still quite favorable where people are able to create high yield um, on appreciation with decent IRRs in, in the teens, um, high teens to uh, higher cash on cash returns than you'll typically see in any, any type of other um, liquid asset. Um, and, and, you know, real estate is continuing to evolve and become even more attractive as different forms of liquidity are being created in the market. Definitely. Well, I think I can just drop the mic and walk off now. I think we can we'll go ahead and wrap things up, Jake. No, nothing else to add. No. <laughs> no, you, you, you were right on, uh, absolutely spot on uh, in terms of being able to combine uh, quality of life. And you find that not just in the United States, you find it all over the place. And then at the same time, having access to a, a, a country that allows for, you know, political stability, economic stability, uh, and even uh, the, the, the dynamic culturally in terms of people moving around and it creates a, a very dynamic marketplace. And so being able to access that market and being able to live where it makes the most sense for the individual. Hey, listen, we're, we're living in a, in a new day and a new age. So one of the other things that, that I, I just kind of wanted to pivot a little bit because you, you mentioned something earlier as you were talking about, you know, getting outside of your comfort zone. At the same time, you, you have this, right? You're, you, you have this curiosity. So you're looking to always be outside of your comfort zone. You're looking to learn new things. You talked to us at the very beginning, like one of the most positive things is you got a great night's sleep after having traveled from a <laughs> boat to a plane to a, to a car. At the same time, you have this desire to solve problems, right? Um, as, just as most company founders do. And I'm also curious, like this general curiosity, this desire to want to look and find a problem and then work on finding a solution to it. Where does that come from? Hmm. 
I don't know. I've always asked a lot of questions. My mom would tell me to, my dad and mom would tell me to stop talking all the time that I talk too much and I ask too many questions. And uh, I don't know. I just have a lot of natural curiosity. I used to read uh, Curious George. Uh, okay, it was my favorite. I don't know. Um, if, if you have, I don't know if you have any kind of uh, desire to, to learn there's just an abundant amount of information out there. And I guess um, part of that curiosity, it just kind of curiosity creates more curiosity. So if you engage in a question about something, even if you don't like it, especially if you don't like it, especially if you think you don't like it or you've never done it before, and you're like, hey, why do I hate this thing? It's probably because you don't know enough about it. Mm. So you start asking questions and you start learning and then you start asking more questions and start learning more and your interest develops deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into that thing. Um, and it leads you down different paths and you never know where those paths are going to get you. So if you're not, I guess, if, if you take that kind of mentality of you're, you're not tied to anything and there's not necessarily an opportunity cost to the time that you're spending because you're invested in the journey of the experience of learning and creating more knowledge, then you're just going to allow yourself to go down that path that doesn't really have a destination. And it's going to give you the experience of learning. And, and sometimes you'll end up wasting a lot of time and not getting what you think might be valuable for yourself. And other times you might make a new friend or discover something new. Um, so it, it just kind of comes from a mindset, I think. Um, and like, again, as I said, that mindset for me, that mindset for discovery was, was, was based on that fear and that feeling trapped and limited and wanting to be able to expand my horizons and develop a better life for myself. Which, and as you start to, you know, one of the results is developing the better life for yourself, but the underlying kind of, uh, the, the underlying kind of, um, curious, the, the, the idea is that there, you are a, by nature a curious person. And so you are also not fearful of asking more questions. And as you ask more questions, you get more inputs, which mm -hmm. is then a, a cycle that can become a very, very fulfilling type of cycle, provided that you allow yourself to listen to the responses, right? List, literally listen to the responses, not just because you don't like them. Sometimes they try to enter, but they don't actually go in, um, which is also one of the reasons that I understand that you're, that you are, and we're going to continue to go down this level now or this down this road, which is how you continue to help other people today. And, you know, you're helping people to solve problems specifically through, through Groundbreaker. And I'd love for you to talk about the, what was the problem that you were seeing that really ultimately said, okay, well, listen, I keep seeing this problem over and over. And it led you to think not just solving something that is very uh, finite, but something that is impacting multiple people. Um, maybe you could take us a little bit through that journey and how, how that worked, how you were trying to solve a problem and it's turned into something uh, much larger now. Yeah. So it kind of started for me in several different ways. Uh, when I was working in this real estate investment trust, it, you know, it, 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 this is kind of where the idea uh, seeded itself. I was in the role of an analyst and an associate in a real estate investment firm where we were taking on capital from investors and then allocating that capital into single assets. They were hotels, mid-scale hotels, think like your Holiday Inn or your Hampton Inn or your Courtyard Marriott um, products. And mm -hmm. we would buy those when they were distressed on the market and we would reflag them. Um, we would turn a Wyndham into a uh, IHG and we'd do a property improvement plan and we'd manage the asset. And we'd hold it for a period of five to seven years and then sell it at a uh, premium to earn our investors a significant return. But through that whole process of underwriting the asset and collecting the capital, being able to report on the operations and manage the P&L and then be able to distribute funds to investors, there's a tremendous amount of moving parts. And the only tools that we were using were really phone calls, emails, and an Excel spreadsheet. And... Uh, I thought as an investment manager at the time that the job was way too much for the staff that we had. It was highly error prone because we were just punching information into a spreadsheet all the time um, with no, no form of data validation or error checking. It was just all like your eyes glued to a screen 24 seven. 
And, um, and there were no security protocols either for like sending wire instructions and people paying and, you know, <clears throat> those kinds of things caught my eye. And I, th- I thought that there should be a better way to do this. Um, especially because I kind of grew up, I grew up with the internet. Um, I mean, I was the kid that was anything happened to the internet connection. Um, <laughs> I was hearing you were, you were there. someone call across the house, Hey, you know, the internet's down. You just can't take a look at this. And I was building computers in, in my bedroom and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's what gave me the, the impetus to form Groundbreaker, which basically allows a real estate investment professional who wants to own assets and wants to collect capital from their friends and family and other investors to be able to invest in real assets. I, we, we together as a team have built an entire process that covers every, every part of the deal life cycle from putting your investment materials together to offering those materials and a fully compliant and secure digital signature and payment process through a single um, web portal, which possesses your username, password, comes fully branded with the company information. So it just kind of sits on their website and allows you to transact kind of like you're going to an e-commerce store for your favorite um, you know, brand of hoodies. You're going in to actually go and buy shares in a real estate investment. Um, and the whole entire uh, process happens very quickly. It's online, it's digitally signed, it's digitally held in a database that's accessible for, uh, from the investor perspective on a neat portal that contains graphs and images to show you your reporting of how much you've invested, how much you're, you're getting in returns, how much capital you've taken out. There's a way to set up your bank account, kind of like you're investing in the Robinhood. You can just see your money coming in. And uh, the manager on the other side can manage the whole process and do things, you know, like sending your payments used to take a whole day. It can take 30 minutes on Groundbreaker because we've set up a whole tool to be able to process the payments and calculate them and send them out and report them and everything. So, so you know what I would love for the Going Long family to take away from what you just said, aside from the simplicity, the speed with which, you know, you can use um, the, the, the tool that your company, um, uh, has, has put together and continues to, to make easier, faster, um, is from the very beginning, you talked about the, where you went back to where you had your training, right? You, you had your, your, your education, you understood more about the hospitality industry. You were then le- leveraging that, helping other investors gain direct access to distressed assets. So from there, you also have gained more insight into what a potential investor is looking for, understanding how to underwrite, which is something you'd done previously as well. And then ultimately, because you have this problem solver in you, you realize like, hey, listen, there are lots of points of failure here and nobody's really paying any attention to this. So why don't I try to see about bringing a solution to market that is going to help people be much more efficient, do it in a way that's faster, maybe it's easier. And it's also to help the Going Long family to understand, like, listen, there are a lot of you that are in very, very high paid, busy professional roles. You probably won't stay there forever, or maybe you do, but just think about this. Like Jake is just giving you a very clear example as even when he was getting corporate experience, he was gaining insights to something that eventually led him to found his own company, right? And and, and it's because you're looking to solve problems, you're looking to help others and, and being able to do that. It may not be everybody's path, but there's a lot of also positive things that can come out of, uh, of, of working in a corporate role. And so uh, you may be able to parlay that into something that you're doing for yourself as well. So I don't know, Jake, it looked like you wanted to add something else there again. No, we, we just, I, I just want to say like we made, we've, we, what we've done is we've looked at the problem that exists in the space, the lack of security, the lack of compliance, and just generally the complicated nature of doing the work for both the investor and the general partner who's putting together the investment. The reason why deals don't get done is not a lack of capital. Um, The reason why an investor doesn't invest is either they they don't feel enough trust and conviction in the process, or it's too difficult and complicated for them to do it. 
And there's so many reasons for why people don't make a purchase or do an investment. It's because it's, it, it's, it's too hard. You've got to, you know, you've got to do too many things and jump through too many hoops to do it. So uh, I think what, we, what we've done that's creating more opportunity for more people is just lowering the barrier to entry for real estate investing for everybody, for the general partner to be able to get to making investments happen much faster and for the investor to be able to cut through more red tape and just streamline the process of allocating their capital and getting to an investment securely in a compliant way. Love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I, I guess with that, would, would you say that one of the, one of the strengths is also as you, as you lower that barrier to entry is just making the process understandable and easier because a lot of times for people, they may not necessarily even understand what the process is because they're working with someone that doesn't maybe clearly lay it out. Um, but there's a level of trust, but that, that clear, that clearness of process is actually what helps to take the confidence and the trust to the next level. Yeah. Um, yes. On both sides, on both sides, it gives the, the general partners some confidence to be able to move forward and know exactly what they're doing. It's like a blueprint and infrastructure for them. Some of them who have never even raised capital for the first time, they've been doing JV deals and uh, they're ready to get to the next level and do a syndication for a larger, say a 50 unit or hundred unit apartment complex or something. So that helps them to be able to have that confidence. And then that confidence projecting from them uh, helps them build you know, confidence with their investors and their investors feel confident too, because they're logging into something. They have a username and a password and two-factor authentication and they're logging into a system and it's nice and clean and professional looking. And they can just, you know, tump it, bunch in some numbers and they can invest. It's like, wow, where, you know, I can't believe investments weren't done like this before. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wait, hang on a second. This is actually something that's secure, safe. And I'm enjoying the process. So it's, uh, it's kind of nice. It's like, I love, you know, Airbnb as a business because it changed the way that we look at rentals. And uh, we used to all go on to Craigslist. Uh, I mean, if you think back, maybe you still do it in Europe. I'm not sure. But like back in the days, I was always looking on Craigslist for apartments for temporary mm -hmm. rental whenever I was subletting or traveling or anything like that. And uh, I can't imagine ever going back to Craigslist and emailing a bunch of people for an apartment listing. Yeah, I don't think no. that happens that often anymore. That's pretty much uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole new a whole new era, a whole new yeah. era. Um, no, and that makes so a, that makes a, like that. makes a lot of sense. No, it absolutely makes makes a lot of sense. And it's about you know bringing it and making it more accessible and and easy and fun, uh, which is, which is great. And so here's the thing, Jake. I'm glad you gave us an insight as to how um, how you are with Groundbreaker. You're helping uh, lower the barrier to entry, also making things much more understandable, process-driven, secure, uh, and sound. The thing is, we kind of got to get to the going long final three, though. And the thing is, Jake, I never ask anybody the going long final three. And today, you're our special guest, unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you. So are you ready? All right, let's go. <laughs> I knew you. Were, yeah, I thought you were going to be like, yeah, man, I'm born ready. I'm like, I knew, I knew that. <laughs> so, here, so here we go. So we started with you, I guess, residing in Chicago, although today you're in Rio de Janeiro. Um, my Portuguese is terrible, sorry. Um, but uh, I would love for you, because we kind of started with you on that side of the pond, I would like to bring it back to this side of the pond here in Europe. Could you share with us, what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or is still on your bucket list to visit? You're going to hate me for saying this, but... I can already feel it. <laughs> I uh, can already feel it. It's Madrid. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you were going to say that. That's all good. You got it. You got Madrid experience. I put it out there. Everybody in the Going Long family knew it was going to be there. So Madrid, that's cool. So let's get to number two. Um, and this is one of the things that I have noticed from just being very, very fortunate and having a lot of exposure to and interactions with very successful people. And Jake, I would consider you to be someone very successful on many different levels. And, and hopefully you agree with me because one of the things that... I've noticed with very successful people is that they, unlike most people, are mostly successful because the very first time that they do things, they get it right. And then they're able to get other people to get, oh, I can't believe it. I did that again. No, it's kind of an inside joke. All the going long family knows about this joke. It's, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Um, because you know what? We all make mistakes, man. Everybody makes mistakes. And, and the reality is, Jake, very successful people, they make a whole lot more mistakes than most people, a whole lot more. The difference is they do do one thing very, very differently, and this is true, because those very successful people, especially when they have very relevant 
mistakes, learning opportunities, whatever you want to call them. You get the picture. They do this one thing differently, and it's that every single time they're relevant learning opportunities, mistakes, what have you, they stop. They learn from the mistake, and then they put strategies, tactics, or actions in place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. So I would love for you to think not about the learning opportunity or mistake, but most importantly, what is the one lesson that you learned that you know that the Going Long family needs to hear today so that you can help them to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening to them? I would say um, one of the most important things I've learned is to develop, develop experience hiring and recruiting people it's one of the most important qualities you can ever have. Um, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to hire the wrong people. Okay. You got to be okay with that. You're going to fail a, a lot in that. And I've failed a ton and it hurt in many different ways, but you have to do it and you have to be willing to do it. The best way for you is to always interview a lot of different candidates and putting in that work is really hard, but it's worth it. Um, try to interview for every VP you hire, try to interview 30 potential candidates and, um, and continue developing your hiring process because the people in your organization are going to be who drive the company. It's not going to be you. It's going to be the people. So yeah. recruiting and hiring can, is the best. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Being able to spend the, the, the right amount of time, have the guidance on recruiting, hiring, talent development, something that's absolutely key. So I appreciate you sharing that insight with us as well. And then one last thing that I, on the going long final three that I do want to ask you, and this is kind of the, to kind of take us home is what is the one book? Cause we want to help to feed everyone's mind. The one book that you would recommend to us today. So I'm going to recommend a book that I recently read uh, that made it great impact on me and where I'm going in my trajectory as a business being in a a B2B software space. It's called the cold start problem. The cold Um, start problem. I believe it's by Andrew Chen. Who's a, he's a venture capitalist and former executive at Uber. And it talks about network effects. Uh, Network effects are heavily underutilized in technology companies but they make up for uh, an outsized um, part of their growth. And it has become much more relevant in today's world as we continue to become more interconnected. So it's just a very creative way to start thinking about growing your business. Very cool. The cold start problem. So we will uh, make sure that we also include that in the show notes. And uh, Jake, man, I can't believe, like these conversations just fly by. In this conversation today, I felt like we just started a second ago, right? And right when we were starting, you were telling us about, you know, coming from Atlanta, Georgia and being part of a family that was in food and beverage. And you got started and everything from kind of the the, the back office to to then interacting with others. And then you realized that there, even having grown up in this kind of, I guess, nice, safe environment, you knew that you wanted to be able to grow and you wanted to get out and you wanted to do things that were outside of your comfort zone. And so you were able to do that. You've really started getting into another industry, com- com- well, building on that industry in the, in the hospitality industry, getting started, getting that market research role. And, and then, well, you even started getting some overseas experience after that in your favorite place in Europe, Madrid, of course. But, uh, you know, we, we still we still love you, man. We still love you. <laughs> and, and, and after that, you know, even getting there and the story that you t- shared with us, being able to get in a place and you kind of got lost and then eventually, well, you figured it out. And so that's gone on and on. And then you got into an area where you began to understand more about um, distressed assets that are in the hospitality industry and then being able to help to tie those for those assets that are based in the United States, helping to bring in a consensus for people that were in Latin America and helping them to understand, even though there were thousands of kilometers or tens of thousands of kilometers of distance, that this was still a great place potentially for them to be able to preserve their capital. And then not only from that, you were helping to solve that problem and you recognize why you were in this corporate role that, hey, listen, you know what? There are a lot of inefficiencies that are happening here. And so your problem solving nature said, hey, listen, I want to solve this issue with security, issue with uh, it being a, a friendly and issue with it being something that is much easier to use and better to use. And let's bring it all together. 
And so then you founded Groundbreaker and that being able to do that, you are building an organization that's helping both syndicators as well as investors to feel much more comfortable, to feel much more confident, to lower the barrier to entry. And I know this is just a part of this story, man. And so I know that there are so many people that are part of the Going Long family today, Jake, that are thinking, oh my gosh, I want to find out more about Groundbreaker. I was just thinking about getting into the syndication game or I've been doing this and this sounds like a much more efficient way. Or people are just like, I love the fact that this guy is in Rio today and his business is back in the United States. So <laughs> help us to understand, Jake, what is the best way for the Going Long family to find out more about you and what you have going on at, uh, at Groundbreaker? Yeah, so if you're interested in following us, uh, please uh, check us out on any kind of social media, Groundbreaker Co. Uh, we're also we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook. Um, you can also go to our website, groundbreaker.co. Uh, it's not.com. Uh, so just make sure you get that right, groundbreaker.co. Um, and then anybody can, can email me. I'll give out my email and phone number. Uh, if you want to chat, if you want to learn more about real estate, if you want to learn about investing, if you just want to talk about Brazil, Spain, or anywhere else, no problem. <laughs> I'm ready for you. Jake at groundbreaker.co. Uh, 312-847-5515 is my direct line. Okay. Right on. Perfect. So we will uh, we'll include that in the in the show notes. And Jake, man, I, I really just, uh, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience with me, with the entire Going Long family today has been absolutely awesome. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure being here. All right. All right. Awesome. If you give me just a second, Jake, I just want to share the last words with the Going Long family and then we'll get out of here. Uh, just, I mean, family, what can I say? I mean, Jake, what, a, what an amazing story taking all of his life experience, being able to now bring that into a company that is going out to help solve a problem uh, for both the syndicators as well as those looking to invest. And I know there's so many of you that are like, wow, this sounds like an amazing thing. And you want to find out more about what, uh, what Jake has going on. Take him up on his offer. Feel free to reach out to him. Go to their website, groundbreaker.co, uh, and uh, you'll be able to find out much more. So until then, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. <laughs>